Father, I just thank you so much, Lord, for, for just being privileged, Lord, to be a part of your church and to, uh, to just witness firsthand, Lord, the work that you're doing in the hearts of these men and women and in their lives, Lord, and overflowing into the lives of others. And uh, the people that walk in darkness have seen a great light, and I thank you that there is, there is light here, Lord. There are, there are lights burning. And Lord, I just I, I wish I could take these people back to America and, uh, and, and people could get a taste of this, this light, Lord, this working of your spirit, Lord, this openness and genuineness of hearts to just fear you and serve you and seek you. And Lord, I... I'm an American. I came here as an American, Lord, and there's things that I lack in my life and in my faith, Lord, to be made perfect. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me while I'm here. And at the same time, Lord, if there's a gift that you've given me, I pray, Lord, that you would bless others through it, Lord God. I'm nothing special, Lord. I'm, I'm just a vessel. I'm, I'm kind, of a, kind of a strange vessel, Lord. I'm different. I'm, I'm oddly shaped. I may be a little bit small. I don't know. But I know that uh, if you fill me, Lord, with the Spirit of Christ, then I can be a vessel unto honor, Lord. And, and that's my prayer. That's my prayer for all these people here, Lord. I pray that you would bless your church and that we would bless you, Lord, and walk in your grace. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is great. You know, I, I, I met some of you on, uh, on the, the Zoom meeting before. I remember Jonathan and Natasha. And uh, it's so, so great to, uh, to see you in person, to meet you in person, to see your faces. And I was actually searching the scriptures this morning, um, still not quite sure of uh, what I was going to talk about today. And I was, uh, as I was looking for one thing, I found another. And uh, what I found was Colossians chapter 2. So we'll turn there. I just want to read this. So as I was reading this this morning, I was like, it sounds kind of familiar. It sounds like something I'm going through right now something that I'm feeling. So Colossians chapter 2, and just starting at verse, verse 1, Paul says to the Colossians, for I, would, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, as for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And I know none of you have seen my face in the flesh <laughs> up until now, but Amen that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words." For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you th through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So I, I think I'm going to go through this in, in a little bit more uh, detail, but this is just, I read this this morning and I was like, wow, that's just everything that's on my heart right now. That uh, j just the joy at being able to to, to see your faces in the flesh and, and just to be witness of, of what the Lord is doing here. Um, I haven't met all of you on the Zoom meeting, um, probably, probably most of you um, I haven't. Um, 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, who I am. I don't really want to talk about myself because I'm not preaching myself, but just, just by way of testimony, um, the Lord has definitely done things in my life and that's why he can use me as a vessel because he's prepared me in some ways. Um, so I grew up in, in what was uh, supposed to be a Christian home. Um, my parents, my mom and dad, they, I'll say at least they believed that they were Christians um, at the time that I was born. Um, I have one older sister, Teresa. She's a year older than me. And we were brought up in what tried to be a Christian home. Um, but there was not a lot of knowledge and wisdom as far as what that meant. Um, so I was raised with the Bible. I grew up reading, reading the Bible since I was like four years old. So it's been 35 years now I've been reading the Bible. Thank God that was the best thing that I have from my childhood. Um, I was raised in a church where parts of the Bible were really emphasized. Um, the focus of our church, it was kind of, kind of a weird sect. I don't know if you guys have anything like that here in South Africa. If you don't, praise the Lord. <laughs> one less confusion, one less distraction, one less deception. Um, I know you guys have things that, that the church struggles with here. Um, and, uh, and I know the Lord is, uh, he, he's good to you. He's, uh, he's, he's been faithful to, to show you light and show you truth. Um, so I thank, I thank him for that. Um, but, but this thing, just, just a, a little bit about it, is I was, I was brought up in this church and in this sect that emphasized Paul and the writings of Paul over everything else in the scripture even the, the, the teachings of Jesus Christ. We were basically taught that Paul is our apostle for today. He is the apostle for the Gentiles, and therefore we ought to listen to him more than everything else in the Bible. Yeah, that is a grave error. And that is, that is what I was raised in, that I was steeped in, um, that is what we heard from the pulpit every week. Uh, occasionally, we'd use other parts of the Bible, but if ever there was something that, that Jesus said or the other apostles said or the prophets said, we were told like, well, you can't really take that and apply it to yourself because that's for someone, that's for the Jews. Or that's, that's for someone else. That's not for us. We're just, we're just Paul. And the problem with that is that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He, he even said, you know, I, I, I turn to it quickly here. In 1 Corinthians, you can start in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. Which, Actually, I could just start in, in verse, uh, I could read the whole chapter. Uh, <laughs> look, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we're called to, folks, the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. What's the same thing? Well, it's all about our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, if it, it's, it's all about Him. It's, it, it's all about who He is. It's all about His doctrine. It's all about what He did on the cross and His resurrection for the dead. It's all about Him. It's about Him, and it's about Him in us. That is Christianity and nothing else. But he says, he gets down here, there's contentions among you. Verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Man, Paul, you know, again and again and again, he would say, look, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Everything is about Christ. Verse, uh, you can go down to... What, chapter 3, he continues on the same topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says, verse 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? When you start saying, look, our church or our group is going to follow this guy. If this guy isn't Christ, that, that, that's, that's, that's the wrong direction you're going. Okay? Paul's a good man. Paul was an, a, a man that, that Christ gave for an example of how to follow him and to show the sufferings that we would go through. And he used Paul as, you know, there are many people going through great sufferings in the world for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he used Paul as kind of an extreme example of that. Yeah, yeah. Set him, setting him forth as an example so we would know what we're getting into. Amen? Amen. Amen. What it means to be a Christian. Amen. But it's not about Paul. It's about Christ. And he says, verse 5, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, <laughs> neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Paul is saying, look, I have planted, but he that planteth isn't anything. It's all about God. It's all about what He's doing in us through Christ. That's Christianity. So back to what I was saying. Um, this is the way that I was brought up. I was brought up in this church and in this sect that basically said, no, everything's about following Paul. But the thing is, if your eyes are on Paul, you're not even going to be able to follow Paul as an example because his eyes were on Christ. The only way to follow Paul, really, is to follow Christ. And then you'll be, you'll be following Paul's example of following Christ. And that's, that's what Christ put Paul there for, is to be an example of how to follow Christ. But what happens, if you, if you start following a man, even a good man like Paul, okay, then what happens is you're going to end up like the Jews... You go to uh, John chapter, I was going to say John chapter 8, but I don't think this is what I was think, thinking of. John 5. Yes. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> okay. See, the Jews, the Jews thought that, that they were following Moses. They wanted to be Moses' disciples. As a matter of fact, I think it's John chapter 9, right? Man, it's John 5, John 9, John 8. <laughs> all got it's good all stuff. Good. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. And uh, yeah, okay, so in John 9, I think that's kind of what I was thinking of. You remember, um, well... Let's just turn there, John chapter 9. And, uh, and this is where Jesus healed a man that was born blind. And when Jesus healed a man that was born blind, that's, that's something that was never, ever done before in the history of the world. That was something that was new and that was reserved for Messiah when he came. That he would be able to open the eyes of a man born blind. And, uh, and he did that. And, and the Jews were, were angry with this guy because he wanted to follow Christ. He knew, he knew man, there's something special about this guy. He's not a sinner like us. He's, he's, uh, he's something special. And verse 28, and then the, the Pharisees, you know, the, the Jews, they reviled him. 
and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we, not, we know not from whence he is. And, uh, and these guys thought of themselves as Moses' disciples. But Jesus tells them, look, you're nothing like Moses. Just like they thought they were the children of Abraham. He looks at them and says, you guys are nothing like Abraham. And it's the same way with, with this thing that I was brought up in. Everybody said, oh, we're following Paul, we're following Paul. But they were nothing like Paul. I was nothing like Paul. Paul knew Christ intimately. He had things revealed to him directly by Christ. His whole life was Christ to the point that he just cast everything else aside. And I forgot what I was going to say next. Yeah, we were nothing like that. We were nothing like that. I mean, all we were doing, all we were doing was using Paul as an excuse to say, we're sticking by Paul's epistles and discarding the rest of the Bible because it's a little bit too hard for us. It's too hard for us to walk in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. We'd actually have to give up things. We would actually have to take up our cross and bear it and walk after him. And one of the saddest things I've ever heard from someone who professed to be a Christian it was my dad. One day I'm over at his house and I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to give him some light. I'm trying to help him understand the truth and tell him, no, it's not about Paul, it's about Christ. And I'm, I'm telling him about how important it is to take heed to the doctrine of Jesus Christ and what he was teaching his disciples. And one of the saddest things I ever heard was when my dad said, well, for us today, obeying him is like optional. And I don't know if you guys have anything like that here where they tell you that Obeying God is optional. That it's okay. This is this is a plague that we have in the U.S. right now. Okay, is that people will tell you they will focus on an event in the past and say, "Oh, it's all about being born again. You you just got to be saved, and after that, it doesn't really matter." Or anything else that you do for God after that. It's just, it's just like a bonus. It's just to get some extra rewards when you get to heaven. That is not the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Man, I'll tell you. God has a way. He has a path for you to walk. It's called the way of righteousness. And this, this problem that we have in the U.S. is that the whole Bible talks about this way of righteousness. And this is a way for us to walk in. It's the way of eternal life. And Jesus came to make that accessible to us. So that we could walk in his grace. So that he would be glad to give us eternal life. But what we've done in the U.S. is we've said no. The whole Bible is about this way of righteousness. But Jesus made a way around it for us so that we don't have to walk in the way of righteousness to be saved that, that we could just be saved from the penalty of our sins and not actually be saved from our sins but what does the gospel say Matthew chapter 1 why did he come what's his name his name is Jesus, which means what? What does the name Jesus mean? Yeah, it means salvation. Matthew chapter 1, and verse 21, it says, this is the angel speaking uh, to, uh, to Joseph. He says, and, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. 
you know, they, they, they try to tell you, again, I don't know how much of this you have here, but they try to tell you in the U.S., well, he just wanted to save you from the penalty of your sins. So that even though you go through this life and you can't ever stop sinning, well, at least you don't have to go to hell now at the end because of Jesus. Wow, what a gospel. Wow, that's just such wonderful news. I'll tell you, this is a better gospel. That Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins. Sin destroys. Sin kills. Sin just, it just brings rottenness. We were, we were talking, uh, talking a couple days ago, doing some devotions at the house. And uh, little Adelaide asks, as we're reading this verse, what's rottenness? Yeah, rottenness is, it's what sin does to you. Rottenness is like when you take something that's good, the Bible says that God hath created man upright. Well, you look around today and you see what sin does. That's rottenness. It's when something good goes bad and it just decomposes. And it, 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 doesn't just, it doesn't just die itself and break down itself, but it starts breaking down everything else around it. It spreads, it corrupts. That's what sin is. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Okay? What does that salvation include? Just the penalty of sin at the end? No. No, no, there's a great thing that Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. The Bible says that through his blood, we have forgiveness of sins, and that's the riches of his grace. Forgiveness of sins. But if your Christian life is just, well, I'm going to sin because I know I'll be forgiven, so then afterward I'll repent, but then I'll go and do it again, and then I'll just do it again, and just keep doing That's not being saved from sin. That's not being saved from sin. What is salvation from sin? Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Look at that. Ended up in John 8 after all. <laughs> Amen. This is just such a great chapter. Okay, so John chapter 8 and uh, verse 30 says, As he spake these words, many believed on him. You say, okay, well, they're saved, right? Well, <laughs> let's, uh, let's read on. <laughs> then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Okay, there's a difference between in name and in deed. Okay, James talks about in deed and in truth. Okay, you know something's in truth when you start seeing the deeds follow it. Sure. Amen. In deed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm. What's he talking about? Well, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? How about a little history lesson? Okay, how, how about a quick little history lesson? You say you're Abraham's seed. You've never been in bondage. Let me just read what God said to Abraham in Genesis 15. Okay, this is a prophecy. Um, he says, this is when, when Abraham is asleep. His name is Abram. He said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Okay? He, he spoke that to Abram directly about Abraham's seed. And they're like, Oh, what, we're Abraham's seed. We've never been in bondage. Yeah, they were in bondage to Egypt, and guess what? They needed God to lead them out of that bondage. Amen, amen. Jesus is saying the same thing to them amen. right here. <laughs> How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Hold on. <laughs> Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Let that sink in. <laughs> Jesus is saying, look, you take heed to my words, you're going to know the truth. You'll be made free. Well, what do we need to be made from? Made free from? If you commit sin, you're in bondage. You're still in bondage. You're the servant of sin. And that's what he wants to make you free from. He wants to make you so free from sin that you don't commit sin anymore. And that's, that's, you know, it's, it seems like such, a, such an impossible thing, such a lofty thing. Like, what? How in the world? Well, I'm a sinner. How can I possibly not commit sin? This is something we're struggling with in the U.S. right now. Um, when Adam was there just a few months ago, just trying to exhort believers that, yes, according to the faith of Christ, he wants to make you free from sin so that you don't commit sin, that you actually can be perfect unto God because that's the way he wants you. Amen. And that's not, that's not just possible. That's a commandment. Man. <sighs> Jesus Christ can make us free from sin. Okay, this, this is, is it impossible? Yes, it's impossible. It's impossible. Does God ever command us to do something that's impossible? Yes. <laughs> you know why? So that we can't do it without him. Because nothing is too hard for the Lord. He's the God of all flesh. He's the father of spirits. He's the prince of life. There's nothing too hard for. So, again, I was, I was kind of going into a little bit of testimony about myself. And uh, I, won't, I won't go into a, a lengthy... Um, a story for you guys, but just to say this about myself, um, I'm not a great speaker. <laughs> I'm I'm not a great preacher. I'm not. Uh, I have a lot of shortcomings. Um, but in so much as I'm a member of the Lord's body. He's given me his spirit. And he's given me a, a gift. Um, and I don't say that to put myself up here in authority and say, I have the gift, everybody listen to me. Because every one of you, if you're walking with the Lord, if you're filled with his spirit, he's going to give you a gift too. Maybe more than one gift. And everyone who has a gift is supposed to share it with the rest of the body, okay? I believe the gift the Lord's given me is an understanding of his gospel. And there is a great need for that. Just read through the book of Proverbs and see how important understanding is, okay? Now, I will tell you this. I haven't met a lot of people in the U.S. that have understanding of the gospel, like I have. And I don't say that to boast. I wish that were not the case. Okay? Glory to God, you don't have to fully understand the gospel in order for it to work. Okay? There's a lot of people who really are born again, walking with the Lord by faith, and they don't even understand the journey that they're on. But it's real. It's genuine, even though they don't understand it. But I'll say this. The value of understanding is so that you can focus on the goal 
and make deliberate action to get there. And also, understanding is so important so that you can tell the real thing from the imitation. And what we have in the U.S. is a lot of imitation. We have a lot of things that are not genuine Christianity. We have a lot of things that are not genuinely the church. And uh, we have a lot of Jesus that's not genuinely Jesus. Paul talks about another Jesus, you know, or another gospel. And that's, that's very real in our world today. So uh, one thing that I really hope to do while I'm here is just to meet with as many of you as possible, spend time, and try and impart some of the understanding that I have. Yeah, so uh, Colossians 2 was the text that we started with. Um, and I read this before, but we'll, we'll just kind of read it a little bit slower now. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. And, you know, again, I talked about I'd, I'd seen some of you before, not in the flesh, but uh, the conflict, you know, I, I definitely feel the conflict. You know, for, for the last few years, Adam has been trying so hard to get me here. And, uh, and he just asked me a few weeks ago. Uh, it was, yeah, literally, I think it was less than a month ago. And he asked me, so Ray, are you serious about wanting to come to South Africa? Because what had happened was I was going to come in 2020. And right, right when I was like about to make these plans, then this COVID thing started and... Um, it just didn't seem like uh, it was the best time for it. But when Adam said that to me a few weeks ago, I was like, yes, I'm coming as soon as possible. And uh, to be honest, the reason why I said that and why I, I went and did it right away is because I wanted you to know, yeah, I am serious. I really did want to come. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, and to be honest, I would love to come here and stay with you because I see the need. Uh, I see the need and my heart is really here with you all. Um, the conflict that I have, to be honest, is that there's also a great need where I am. There's a great need and I, I've been telling you about why. Um, not, not just in the U.S., but especially in the, the circle or the area that I've been in. Um, there's just so much error. And I, it's hard for me to, knowing what I have, to go somewhere else and not help there. So I've been looking for a place where I can help, um, for an opportunity where I have liberty. Um, it hasn't really come. I don't know if it will, but I, I just wanted to share that with you all. That's, that's what's in my heart. Verse 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. It's the first thing I felt when I came here. And I just started meeting some of you guys. Jonathan, I think, was the first one that I met. He, he came over to our house there. And uh, just, I, yeah, I, I didn't mean you. I meant the Jonathan behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> no, no, Jonathan briefly stopped over at our house uh, a few days ago. And uh, that's just the first thing I, I felt was, was this love being knit together in love. And it's like, it, it, that's, that's just, that's different about Christianity. There's nothing like it. Like, it's one thing, like, so one thing about me, I played table tennis for a long time. 
So it's one thing for me to like go to some other city and meet a bunch of table tennis players and we have table tennis in common, so what do we do? We play table tennis, okay? <laughs> but Christianity is different because it's not about just you know, some activity that we do or some hobby that we have in common or something like that. Or, or, or even like, you know, maybe uh, the same language or like I go to Canada and we both speak English so we can get along. Christianity is so, so much deeper than that because it goes right to the soul and right to the heart and it connects people in real love. Man, it's, yeah, there's just nothing else like that in the world. And what did Jesus say? He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. And that's just what I felt as soon as I came here. People that I don't even know. All I know is that the Spirit of Christ is here and it's like, wow, I just want to just open up my heart to all of you. And, uh, and it says in, in, in 1 John, we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. We know that we, I'm probably quoting that wrong, but that's, that's one of the assurances that we know we have the real gospel, that the faith of Jesus Christ is real in us, is that when we meet people who are God's children, there's just that, that genuine love it's not faked, it's not feigned, it's real. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And again, uh, like I said, I really believe that that's the gift that the Lord gave me is understanding in particular of the gospel. And Understanding brings riches of full assurance. One thing that, that I noticed about this weird gospel that I was taught before, it's another gospel, it's some weird gospel, but it's like, it's so tricky. Like, we'll take this verse and we'll use it, like, we'll use John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we'll take that one verse, but then we'll say, oh no, we can't use the other words, Jesus, because those are for the Jews. But we'll take this one verse. That's, it's like a weird way of extracting some kind of gospel out of this book. And what it does is it creates a lot of doubt. Because then you're like, well, am I doing it right? Am I pulling out the right verses? Am I really right to take this verse and, and not this chapter or not this book? It's really weird. It doesn't give you assurance. The assurance, when, when, you, when you follow that way, the assurance comes from everybody else telling you, oh, you're saved now. You're one of his. You're in now. But this... Riches of the full assurance, that comes from understanding. And that's something that I didn't have before until, you know, one, one time in my life, I, I remember this time in particular, but Adam and I were teaching some, some Bible study um, at my parents' house, just like he was uh, just mentioning. And we were teaching, well, I, I won't even get into what it was, but I just realized that we couldn't teach what we were planning on teaching because it wasn't really in the Bible. <laughs> and, and at that point, I just realized that I had been deceived, that I didn't know what the truth was. And I just, I was at my desk in my, uh, my apartment where I am right now. I think it was right after I moved in. I'm at my desk and I'm like, God, I don't know what the truth is, but I know you have it. And I just told him, I'm willing to throw away everything that I know or think I know just to get the truth from you. <laughs> and, I, and I meant that with all my heart. And you know what? From that point on in my life, 
that's when he started giving me real understanding. And I just, I just thank him and praise him for that. Amen. Uh, hey. Riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. The acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. It's like, God is such a mystery. You know, it's like we, 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 we grow up as children into this natural world. And I'm sorry, am I like moving around too much? Okay. <laughs> we grow up as children in the flesh. You know, we see this natural world and, and everything's a mystery to us. But we grow up and we start to gain some knowledge of the world. But God is... He's invisible. He's, he's beyond, I mean, we can see, we can, we can, you know, he's visible by faith when we see things in the creation. We can, we can know that there's a God. But, but he's invisible and just so many things about him, about who he is and what he is and what his will is and what his plan is for us is just a mystery. And, uh, and, and, by his scriptures, and by his spirit, and by his working, he reveals that mystery to us, that he's the Father, and that he's got a way for us to be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. And that there's a, a relationship between Christ and the Father, that he's the Son of God. And the fullness of this mystery that just like he's the son of God, his gospel is for us in his image to be also made sons of God so that he can be our father too. And that's, you know, that's just a little bit too deep for some people and they don't even want to acknowledge it. But when you have the full assurance of understanding, it really helps you to acknowledge that the things that he said in here, the mystery that he's revealing, it's real. It's possible. It's, uh, it's his will. Verse 3, in, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And if, if there's wisdom and knowledge that's not in Christ, it's, it's not wisdom and knowledge that you want. <laughs> Amen. It could be the wisdom and knowledge of this world that passes away because it's no good and God has no use for it. Amen. It's got no value to us. In Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom. The fear of the Lord. Knowledge. The knowledge of the holy. Those are treasures. And... Uh, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Okay? This verse struck me as I was reading this because that's one of the things that I wanted to do while I was here is I wanted to warn you about things that I had experienced in the States because I know Americans come here. Sometimes you get missionaries or you get whoever coming here and whatever's there could end up over here. So I want to warn you, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Some of the enticing words are, well, that, that, that gospel is a little too hard. We got a nice easy gospel for you. We got a, we got a gospel that's only about a one-time event. You only need faith for a moment to get in. And it doesn't cost you anything. That's beguiling words. And uh, that's enticing words, as they say. If you think about Jesus Christ, 
Okay, you've, you've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You've read all the things that Paul has said about Christ and all the treasures that are in Christ and just how worthy Christ is. Think about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Is there anything different about him than, say, me, Adam, the average Joe walking around outside? Is Jesus Christ like some other man, or is there a real difference? Is there a real difference? A real difference, right? The difference between Christ and some other man is the difference between heaven and earth. He's the Lord from heaven. Man, we're, we're of the earth, earthy, right? There's a huge difference. Let me tell you, that's why the gospel isn't that simple. You know why? Because God is trying to take us from where we are to where he is. That is a huge journey. That, that is not a simple thing. One of, one of the, the things that I always think about when, when, I, when I think about becoming a son of God, I think about what David said. You know, when he when it was proposed to him to become the king's son-in-law, he's like, you guys think it's a light thing to be son-in-law to a king? And that king was only Saul. <laughs> he wasn't even a great king. But David's like, to be son-in-law to a king? Wow, that's not a light thing. That's a big thing. I don't think what it means to be the son of God Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, like the, the, the way Christianity is so often presented, it's like, it's like, okay, I'm Jesus, okay? It's like, if you believe on me, just have a moment of faith. Here, here's a gift. It's salvation. Now you have it and you're saved doesn't work that way, folks. It's not some little gift package. His salvation is a transformation of vile, wicked sinners to sons of the living God. That is a great thing. That is, again, it's something that's impossible. And that's why you can't do it without him. That's why, man, this is, this is, this is a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And, uh, and I don't have to convince you because I know through your testimonies, through the things that you've said that I've heard already, I know that God's done this miracle in you and he's doing it. And, Oh man, I, I, I just I just want to keep going and going. Uh, I, I'll, I'll stay here because I forgot where I was just going to turn to. <laughs> That's brother Ray for you. <laughs> All right, verse five, Colossians two, verse five. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying in beholding your order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Okay? It's not just about the receiving. You receive him so that you can walk in him. Because that's where the transformation happens. Rooted and built up in him established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Amen. The, the one other thing that I wanted to go to there was in Philippians chapter, th not chapter, th yeah, chapter 3.
And we talked a little bit about Paul before and what his attitude was and what his focus was, what his goal was, his heart. And here he just, he just lays it out. He tells you. We just, just start in verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. That I may win Christ. You're looking at one of the most spiritual men who ever lived, probably the greatest Christian who ever lived, I don't know. Maybe. He doesn't, he doesn't say, I did the thing and I'm in. He says that I may win Christ. That I may. He's still on the journey. He's not stopping. He's not slowing down. He's looking forward to it. That I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Again, everything he says is like future, that I may know him. Because he realized, I haven't even gotten to it all yet. There's more. There's much more that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Man, that's when you know you've got a heart for Jesus Christ is when you look forward to being made conformable to his death. Man, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Here's a key verse, verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Not as though I had already attained, See, that's a different spirit. It's a different attitude from what I'm used to hearing where they say, oh, we've already attained. Paul says, not as though I had already attained. Even if you have already attained, it shouldn't be your mindset. You shouldn't be looking on the past. He's about to say that. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's attitude was never, I did all I need to do. It was always, there's more to do. There's further to go. The journey's not over. It's, it's, it's just, I'm on the way, and I'm never going to stop. <laughs> and I tell you, I wish all those people who thought they were following Paul would have followed him in this. Amen. Verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. And uh, I pray that he would. I pray that he would reveal to you what his will is. That uh, it's really to be transformed 
to the image of Christ. And if you look at yourself and you say, hey, I'm not there yet, well, that's okay. Keep pressing. Keep going. And do it in faith, believing that he is able to do it because that's what he's called us to. The strange thing about faith is that it only works if you believe. It, it, might, it, it sounds kind of funny, right? It seems like a no-brainer, but if you think about it, that's, that's the truth. Faith only works if you believe. And uh, there's a walk of faith that we're meant to continue in, to keep believing. And uh, there's a lot of things that we may not know. There's a song about it. It talks about all the things I don't know. But I know whom I have believed. Amen. Amen.